put in this computer. Very good. I will just start recording. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Uh, we have everybody muted. If you could please still um, keep it that way, we can have questions at the end. You can either raise your hand or we could use the chat area. Welcome to the sounding board. My name is Nelly High Iredale. I'm the sounding board chair. This is the Zianit 68th year, which is an official support group of the university. The sounding board is a joint effort of the faculty club and Oceanics. Our honorary chair is here, Thespin Kavulakis. Thank you so much for being here as well. She's the associate of the chancellor and our president, Nigella Hilgert. In Oceanics, we raise money for grants and awards for students, support other UCSD events and activities such as the student run free clinic. We offer many events for our members and sounding board is one of these events. We would love to have you as a member and I encourage you to join. It's only $35 per year. We are happy to see you now via Zoom. Um, we have this event every first Thursday of the month uh, through the, throughout the academic year, except for January. And thank you so much, Judy Vakie, for co-hosting. Now, I would like to introduce to our speaker, uh, our president, Nigella Hilgert. Um, Nigella Hilgert is a biologist, environmental advocate, and photographer concerned with the impacts of climate change on change on ocean and coastal ecosystems. Nigella is a founding member of Ocean Collective, Solutions for a Healthy Ocean, and was the 2019 Climate Art Fellow at the Center for Climate Change Impact and Adaptation at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Previously, as president and CEO of the New England Aquarium, she raised the profile of the aquarium's global conservation and research work by founding the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life, as well as developing a vision for the future of the aquarium and surrounding Boston waterfront. Nigella was the executive director of the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institute, Institution of Oceanography, UC San Diego, where she produced the first major exhibit on climate change on the West Coast. Nigella was born in Ireland and received her bachelor's degree in zoology from Oxford University in the UK, as well as her PhD in evolutionary biology. She has conducted research on behavioral ecology and evolution in birds in many parts of the world, including the United States, Britain, India, Thailand, the Arctic, and South America. Her subject will be Serengeti and Lives Plains. Nigella, thank you so much for being here and presenting this wonderful topic. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Nelly. And I want to start off with an apology that if you hear any very strange noises coming from me, it's actually from the geriatric bulldog who didn't want to be left out. So she's on the floor beside me. Uh, and that's now I'm gonna start sharing my screen and I'm gonna start the talk. So I've called my talk Serengeti Endless Plains because as some of you may know that um, the word Serengeti actually means endless plains or Planes that go on forever without end in the Maasai language, as the Maasai are the pastoralists who um, have cattle and they're nomadic and they um, graze their cattle in and around um, the area of the Serengeti. And why this area is, it's a world heritage site and you can see from this, side, this slide that just the enormous number of animals in this ecosystem is absolutely incredible. And I had wanted as an evolutionary biologist to visit this palace, if you like, of biology for ever since I was a girl and first heard about it. And I was lucky enough to go there 
um, in 2018 for the first time and also at the beginning, about this time last year, I was there. So this is Tanzania, uh, encircled in red in East Africa. And you can see at the, uh, the top of the screen, you can see it says Serengeti Plains. And the Serengeti Plains um, actually extend into Kenya. So the Maasai Mara that some of you may have been to is actually an extension of the Serengeti. And what Serengeti Plains really means is it's the area where the wildebeest live. So it's, if you like, the massive home range of this incredible um, and fascinating animal, even though some people say it looks as if it's been put together by committee. And the um, area at the sort of north um, east of Tanzania in green is the present national park of the Serengeti, but the Serengeti Plains actually extend into the Ngoro Ngoro crater area and also into some of the blank areas on the east and west side um, of the present park. So here I am, and you can probably tell from the look of my face, I'm incredibly excited and thrilled to be in the middle of the migration. We, we stopped very close to a very large herd of migrating wildebeest and zebra. There must have been um, several thousand animals moving through and there were no predators around. So I was able to get out of the vehicle and step out into the savannah. An extraordinary experience. Well, first of all, the wave of heat and still air actually really assaults you. You realize how hot it is, the buzz of the insects, the moaning of the animals, and the smell. The smell is something I remember most. It's, it's a mix of crushed aromatic herbs and dung, animal dung. So it's an extraordinary and powerful image that, that assails all your senses and you just don't forget it. Um, but most of all, it's just seeing sheer numbers of animals. Going to the Serengeti, and the reason it's a World Heritage Site is because it's where you can see the largest number of land mammals left on our planet. It's like going back in time, as close as we can get to going to the Pleistocene, to going back 12, 15,000 years and seeing an ecosystem that is still very, very similar to that of our ancestors, because even going back well over a million years, there's been a lot of paleoecology. So looking at the, the very ancient ecology of the, the region. And although the species were slightly different, the dynamics of this era were pretty similar to what they are today. So it has a, it's a very, ancient and exciting place to visit for a biologist and anyone who's just fascinated by our planet. It's also a very beautiful place. But most people who, when they hear about the Serengeti and the migration, they think about when these animals have to cross the rivers. They, they have to cross the rivers to um, get from the northern part of the Serengeti and the Maasai Mara down into the south and vice versa. And it's very dangerous because you can see they're huddled together. You may drown, the rivers are going very fast flowing, or you may get eaten by a crocodile, neither of which is particularly appealing. And that's what you often see. If you Google migration in the Serengeti, you'll see all sorts of dramatic videos of animals being eaten. But there is so much more to this ecosystem and to these animals than that. So I'm going to start a little bit talking about the history. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen the, um, the movie Out of Africa. And if you remember Robert Redford, uh, he, his character that, that falls in love um, with the heroine, he's called Dennis Fitch Hatton. And he was a real, real character who was extremely interested in this part of Africa, in East Africa. And in those days, the main interest of colonialists in the Serengeti Plains was for hunting lions. And in fact, so many people hunted lions, they were hunting, often shooting out of the vehicles at the lions, a hundred lions a week would be pretty common. So he was worried that lions would go extinct in this area. And so he persuaded the government, that was at that time that the British were in charge of this area, 
to start conserving parts of the Serengeti. Uh, it was an area that historically nobody lived in the Serengeti because there were so many tsetse fly that, um, which carries sleep, sleeping sickness. And so people were very worried that, um, you know, obviously they, they would die if they stayed there too long. So there were some pastoralists who brought their cattle through and a few hunters, but otherwise this was a very um, unlived in area. It's about 12,000 square miles in size, um, but perfect if you want to shoot lions. Um, so it's sort of ironic that that was the reason why the uh, conservation of the Serengeti began. And then for decades, it became a really an outdoor laboratory for scientists who were really interested in large mammal ecology um, of all these, in these incredible species that lived there. And some of you may have read um, Peter Matheson's book, The Snow Leopard, which talks about a trip he did in the Himalayas to look for snow leopards with George Schaller, who was a very famous zoologist of big cats. And for many years, George, uh, with other scientists, lived in the Serengeti. They really had the whole place to themselves. They were a pretty eccentric group of people. And there's a story about George that he's out on his own in his Land Rover, looking, counting, and doing research on lions. And um, he couldn't easily get back onto the road and get back home because there was a whole pride of lions around his vehicle. And so the next day, because he didn't come home, there was a search party. Somebody got in a small plane and started looking for George. And they found his vehicle surrounded by a pride of lions that looked very fat and very happy. And so everybody assumed that George had finally been eaten. And so how to break the news to his wife. So they go back to the um, encampment where a lot of the scientists are living and who opens the door of George's house but George? And everyone was astounded and very happy to see him. And what had happened when he got really bored waiting. So he just got out of his vehicle and walked home across the Serengeti. Can you imagine doing that today and not, and being, ter not being terrified of being eaten? But these, these early scientists were, were pretty fearless people. And in fact, very little happened to, to most of them. Um, and another fearless scientist there was called Tony Sinclair who um, in fact is still doing research in the Serengeti. He's written a wonderful book, which I highly recommend. And it's available on Kindle called The Serengeti Story, which has a lot more wonderful anecdotes about the researchers in the Serengeti and about his own work. He originally went to the Serengeti in the 60s to actually look at the, uh, the bird life in the Serengeti, especially the bird migrations. And uh, he ended up counting wildebeest. Uh, there was some concern that there were low numbers of wildebeest. And at that time, he counted, the first count in the 60s, I think was about 35,000. And five years later, he did another aerial survey count and the number had doubled. So what was going on? Why were the wildebeest populations exploding? What was happening in this area? And now today there is 1. million wildebeest. So there was a lot of talk about, well, what should we do? Shall we um, actually, do we need to start controlling them? Isn't it gonna destroy the ecosystem? This place that we all know and love is going to disappear because it's gonna be overwhelmed by wildebeest. Um, and in fact, this actually didn't happen um, the wildebeest population really flattened out at about 1.4, 1.5 million. And the reason for that is that there's a limit to the size of the population this area can hold. There's a limit to the amount of food available. And also there's, um, so that's if you like pressure from the bottom up, there's also pressure from the top down, which is predation by lions and other predators. And so it seems that that is the carrying capacity uh, for the Serengeti. Are these amazing animals. There's also about a quarter of a million zebra and at least a quarter of a million um, Thompson's gazelles that migrate with the wildebeest. So that's two million animals migrating around this area. And now I want to tell you a little bit about the migration. And 
I'm not quite sure how to move forward here. Why did that suddenly stop? Hmm. Um, I'm having trouble with my computer, it seems to have frozen. Can you help me? Um, Nelly, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Let's see. I am. Um, if you would like to stop sharing your screen, I and... can't do anything. I have. Uh, oh, now now it seems to be moving again. It, it froze for some reason. Perfect. Um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, the good. migration of the uh, water beast. So here we have um, a very diagrammatic um, map of the migration. At the top of the map, going into the Maasai Mara in Kenya, as well as the Northeast, from sort of August, October um, until November, they live in, they spend the dry season when there's much less food to eat in a relatively nutrient poor area, which is the northern part of the Serengeti, the Maasai Mara. And then they start to migrate down south, down the eastern part of the Serengeti. So that's the part on the right, um, when the rains begin. So basically they're following the rains. And um, if the rains don't come and there's a terrible drought, then that's an enormous problem for all the animals in the area. But the rains are very much controlled by the weather, the impact of the Indian Ocean um, on the Serengeti and are relatively predictable still, even though climate change is beginning to be a huge concern about rains in the future and about uh, increasing drought. So they're going south down the sort of east side. They don't stick to a narrow road. They're actually very spread out. So it's more like they're also coming down the center of the Serengeti. And they may even reverse and go a little bit back up if suddenly it's raining further north rather than south. So it's not an orderly migration but at least this map gives you an idea. And so by, by, by sort of January, February, they're right in the south of the Serengeti. And they go there not only because there's a lot of lush green grass, but the soil is volcanic and it is full of calcium and phosphorus that they need for their babies. So these wild beasts are very well adapted. Um, they all have, their babies pretty much within two or three weeks, most of them within a week. So just imagine there you are in the plains and the savannah of the Southern Serengeti, and there are about half a million baby wildebeest within a few days, an extraordinary sight. And of course, really very um, uh, wonderful food for the predators that are in that area. But it seems to be a really good adaptation to have all your babies at once because the predators can only eat a few of the young at a time. So most of these wild beast babies do survive at least at that stage of their life. Um, and people have done some research on wild beast populations in other places that don't migrate and they get uh, much higher rates of predation than these guys that all have their babies at one time. And then they slowly make their way back up um, until they reach the northern Serengeti, the dry season. So you may wonder why, why do they spend their dry season um, up in the north in a relatively nutrient poor part of the Serengeti? And the answer is that is where there is permanent water supply. So if you don't have water, you can't survive, you can't live. And so that's why they have to cross those big rivers and keep in those areas. So this is a, a picture of the beautiful plains of central Serengeti during the dry season. And here are some of the Thompson's gazelles that have that beautiful black stripe down their side. And they uh, have to go to the few water sources that are available during that time of year. This was taken in about November where the rains are just beginning and the migration has started into the center. This in contrast is a wet season. This is in the middle of January where they had a lot more rain than usual. And you can barely see that great big buffalo. It's uh, several feet high of, of lush grass in almost the same area as the previous photograph. 
though the wet season, and in fact, there's a mini wet season, which is, um, is of December, January, and then it may extend into the, the longer wet season, or there may be a drier season, um, which goes, so it goes on for a few months. This is a time of extraordinary abundance and richness, beautiful insects, beautiful flowers, and an abundance of food for everybody. So though most people go to the Serengeti during the dry season, because it's easier to see the migration, the animals are not so spread out, and you can see them more easily in the grass, the wet season is also a stunningly beautiful time to visit this very special place. And as you can see from this photograph, as well as the open plains, there's a lot of this savanna habitat where you've got um, relatively open woodland. In other words, the canopy is open to the sky. The trees are absolutely beautiful. And I could photograph the trees for years at a time in this area. Um, because it was there, this was last January, the rainy season, it's very cloudy as well. So this is just gives you an idea of how lush it is. This was an iPhone photograph from the small plain and you can see how far the savanna extends in the center and the um, western part of the Serengeti. And there you can see the, all these little isolated patches of water. There's so much rain. Um, in fact, there was so much rain that a lot of animals had actually gone back further north to get away. Because if you are, however lush the grass, if it's too wet and you are an antelope or you are a wild beast. You can't run away from predators quickly enough if the ground is too waterlogged. So you have to remember that. When you get to the more open part of the Serengeti, you get these little um, cops, these little copy, which is uh, these are outcrops of granite, and they are a wonderful place for predators to live and rest up in the heat of the day. And so that is a place where people tend to know where to go. The guides will take you to show you the lions and other predators. If you go up further up into the north part of the Serengeti, again, you get a lot of open plain areas and you get a lot of kopi as well. Um, but you're also getting more scrub and more woodland in parts of that area. And this is a, a sort of classic photograph of a lot of these acacia um, semi-open woodland in that part of the Serengeti. Um, also, you, you start coming across these permanent rivers um, with the huge danger you can see in this photograph. Um, there are at least two, I think there are three crocodiles munching on a dead hippopotamus. And I, I tried to show you the, the nicest dead hippopotamus photo that I had because I didn't want you to be um, put off by this too much. But these crocodiles are there and they're, they're pretty real in the, in the northern part of the Serengeti. So again, just to remind you, uh, there's this enormous migration that you can't see anywhere else on the planet any longer of two million animals that goes from the dry season all the way to the bottom of the Serengeti to have their babies at the wet season and the lush grass and then back up again around um, up the west side of the Serengeti. And you know, we, we can't see the migration of the buffalo on the Great Plains in the United States anymore, which must have been an extraordinary sight, but we can at least see the migration of the wildebeest in the Serengeti in East Africa. And I think one of the things as a, as a biologist that interests me so much about migration, whether it's in birds or fish or in um, mammals is that if you can migrate and you have much more access to food resources and so your population can grow bigger. And one of the reasons the wildebeest are so successful and that there's so many of them is that they can actually follow this migration pattern and optimize their population size. And most of the other big migrations in Africa and other places don't exist anymore. The animals may exist in much smaller amounts, but this huge primeval number of animals is really only found in the Serengeti. So I want to talk a little bit more about um, the population changes um, of why the wildebeest 
grew from 35,000 to 1.5 million in really just a few decades. And I think I mentioned earlier that nobody really lived in the Serengeti because it was um, a dangerous place to be because you might get catch seeping sickness. There were all these tetsi fly everywhere. And in order to sort of unravel that and find out the story, you have to go back to uh, towards the end of the 19th century uh, to the Italians introducing domestic cattle to Ethiopia. And unfortunately they brought with them a nasty viral disease of cattle and their relatives called rinderpest. And this virus that is sort of related to measles is devastating, deathly to these, uh, these animals. And it wiped out a lot of the, most of the domestic cattle in um, huge parts of Africa, including East Africa. And it also wiped out the wild relatives that were susceptible to this. So it's one of the sort of tragedies that not many people know about that at the end of the 19th century, the Maasai were decimated. Their population was down by about 90% in this area. That's not something that many people uh, realize. And other um, tribes that lived around, any pastoralist that was associated with cattle, their, their, uh, the animals um, all died. And there was tremendous hardship in the area. And what happened if the, when the cattle died um, and the buffalo and the um, willoughbys disappeared, it meant that um, there was really much less grazing in the area. So there was a lot of the grass grew very, very high and tall, the scrub began to grow. There are natural fires that um, go through every summer past the Serengeti burns. Um, if the grass is very short, these, these fires go through and clear the undergrowth. They don't destroy the forests and they don't destroy the area. A lot of the, the grasses are adapted, well adapted to fire. But if you remove the grazers from the environment, then you're going to get a lot of encroachment into the Serengeti of very thick scrub. And a perfect place for the, the tetsi or the tizi fly to thrive and breed. And of course, it's the tessi fly that is the vector of sleeping sickness of the trypanosome, which is a parasite that gets into the blood system uh, and kills humans. And so um, that is, it's only in the relatively recent history that people didn't live in the Serengeti because um, sleeping sickness was not such a huge problem before Rinderpest wiped out the cattle and then of course wiped out all the wild um, related animals as well. And so what Tony Sinclair was actually recording was the wildebeest bouncing back after the huge vaccination programs for cattle against uh, Rinderpest. Very um, successful early vaccination. We're now very obviously aware about vaccinations uh, because of COVID and one of the most early uh, experimental and successful vaccines, in fact, was the vaccine against rinderpest. And so when rinderpest um, was really wiped out um, and the wild animals could come back, it was as if you were bringing back the lawn mowers of the Serengeti. And that's really what the wildebeest are. There's, there's, there's uh, 1.5 million lawn mowers all keeping the Serengeti grass down. And um, that is why they are known as a keystone species for the ecosystem, the ecology of the Serengeti as a whole. So even though there's varied habitat and ecosystems within the Serengeti, keeping it going as a, as a system, keeping the Serengeti plains going, uh, wildebeest are vital um, for that. So what is a keystone species? And so I want to, to bring us um, back uh, now to the States and in fact, to the coast of the Olympic Peninsula. I was a postdoc years ago at the University of Washington in Seattle. And the head of department there was a, a scientist called Bob Payne. And he was a very well-known ecologist for his work on coastal marine ecosystems, um, 
off the Olympic Peninsula, especially on the island of Tatouche. And he did a lot of experimental manipulation in tide pool areas, removing and adding different species and trying to find out what were important in the ecosystem. And it was he who developed the concept of keystone species. He found that if he removed sea stars from the areas that the, the tide pools that he marked out, they got overrun by mussels. And so the, the rich biodiversity of the tide pools disappeared and the only thing that survived were the mussels because they had been kept low like the grass in the Serengeti by the wildebeest. And here they were being um, eaten by the sea stars. So he coined the, the phrase um, keystone species. Uh, another very classic example, uh, bringing us closer off the coast of California and right up to Alaska is the uh, adorable sea otters, which are considered a keystone species because they love to eat those purple sea urchins which can cause such damage if they are in found in large numbers in kelp forests because they will chew the steadfast of the kelp and basically kill the kelp as a result. And so, in fact, uh, a lot of sea otters were introduced around the Aleutian Islands um, to help the kelp beds uh, flourish there because the otters ate all the sea urchins. And it was a very, very successful experiment. So the concept of keystone species is something that is important in conservation biology. It's a very um, idea of trying to understand if you're trying to preserve or recreate an ecosystem, especially so many of the ecosystems in Africa that have been decimated by war and famine. But um, in recent years, a lot of ecologists have said, well, you know, it's a bit more complicated than that, but there are some systems in which there are particular species that very much act as the keystone, just as you have a keystone in an arch. And if you remove it, the whole arch falls down. The same with the wildebeest in the Serengeti. And so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the animals that you find associated with the migration and the other animals in the area. And I want to um, talk a little bit about uh, this, the zebra, and they, they're not so synchronized in when they have their young. This is very, very young foal. Um, I love the zebras. I think they have great characters. They're also great fun to photograph. And I could show you hundreds of them. But in the interest of time, I will not do that. Um, but they are very tame, beautiful animals. The, I already mentioned the, uh, the Thompson's gazelle, which again are very elegant. Um, and also they don't migrate with them, but also often associated with the Thompson's gazelle and grazing um, are the Grant's gazelles, uh, which are a little bit stockier, have no black stripe in the area. And then of course the buffalo, the buffalo have also rebounded. They don't migrate, they do move around, but in relatively smaller areas, moving around a, a 30 or 50 mile radius is very different from migrating 500 miles. Um, like the wildebeest. The elephants have rebounded. They were greatly pushed in the Serengeti. They have uh, come back in much larger numbers. This was a beautiful male that we discovered on our way up to the northern part of the Serengeti. Now there used to be a lot of rhino rhinoceros in the Serengeti. And um, so at one time there were almost no elephants because they've been poached for ivory and a lot of ry rhinoceros. Unfortunately, of course, this is reversed now. The, Rhinoceroses are being poached and the elephants are coming back. So a lot of, um, a lot of baby elephants, again, this population doing very well. Um, elephants are not perhaps the keystone species for this area, but they are very important as engineers for keeping areas open because they knock down and eat a lot of trees. Beautiful, beautiful animals. So predators. Um, lots of lions. The lions have rebounded. Um, nobody shoots them anymore. And as the their prey species, the wildebeest, have grown in numbers, so have the predators. And there are a lot of lions. They don't follow the migration, the predators. They tend again to have large home ranges and um, they have plenty of food um, most of the year from the animals that are around. 
and then they will be able to eat a great deal of food when the migration happens, and that is particularly often when they are going to have the greatest numbers of young as well. And um, as you know, lions are very affectionate. They spend most of their time sleeping, they tend to hunt at night, um, and uh, very strong bonds within a pride. It's, they're usually sisters, with, with one male. Um, I can watch the youngsters all day. It's absolutely, the young lions are really adorable. And they, the male was very tolerant. You can see on the left here, there's this cub really trying to chew at the male. And eventually he gets fed up and he gives a big roar. And they, there are leopards. There are quite a few leopards in the Serengeti. They tend to be restricted more to areas where there are bigger trees, where they can uh, escape from lions and, and hyenas, um, and also where they can take their prey up a tree as well. Hyenas. Um, I think it was Nelly who said, oh, don't start with a hyena photo, please. <laughs> but um, they are a very important predator in the Serengeti. Uh, and another of these very eccentric scientists, uh, Hans Crook, had spent many years in the Serengeti and he managed to show that not just scavengers, they are very important predators in their own right and they hunt in packs and you can see here they have just demolished a wildebeest and there's just a little bit of the, the wildebeest left. Um, something they love to do is wallow in the mud when it's hot and this helps them cool off as the mud dries. Cheetah, there are cheetah in the Serengeti Plains. Um, incredible animals and, and such a, a joy and honor to watch them hunt. You know, these animals are very relaxed around vehicles. They're very, in the areas where tourists are allowed, they are very familiar with vehicles and tend to get on their life. And so you can really spy or eavesdrop, if you like, on the lives of these animals. Um, this is actually a cheetah and a cheetah sibling that have just eaten a very large animal, couldn't tell what it was. And they try, they're trying to eat all of it before they have to give it up to an incredibly important part of the ecosystem, which are the vultures. This is a hooded vulture, which is often goes first in to make with that big beak, uh, hooked beak, make tears in the carcass so that all the other vultures will come on behind uh, and eat the carcass. In this case, of course, the cheetahs that already been at it. And you can see the, the marabou stalks um, and I think there are some white-shouldered vultures. They're all waiting um, for the cheetahs to get too nervous and to leave them to the remains. So there's a marabou stork. I mean, I love birds, but I have to say, I think that is one of the ugliest things I've ever seen in my entire career, but there we are. They're fascinating though. And these are the vultures, more and more of them are gathering, more flying in. The cheetah's having this desperate last chew of its meal and then it has to give up and leave. So I think it was nearly said, why don't you start with giraffes? Well, here they are. So the giraffes are found, they do see them on the, on the plains, but it's more closer to the savannah where they have um, a lot of leaves on the trees like acacias that they love to browse on. Um, and I think they're, they're one of my very favorite animals. They always seem so relaxed, so elegant. Um, and on the acacia trees, you also see that they have a really interesting relationship with these ants that, that live on the acacia and help protect the acacia trees. So there's a, there's a, a young teenager. Doesn't that just look like a teenager giraffe to you? And there is a mum with a much, much younger giraffe. Uh, I, just, I just love these animals. I think they're absolutely fabulous. Jackals. So there are, uh, again, a lot of smaller mammals um, on the Serengeti, a lot of smaller predators. And you've got the, the golden jackal on the left, and then you've got the black back jackal on the right here. Monkeys. There are vervet monkeys uh, in the Serengeti. There are also baboons. Um, and there's a mum with uh, the baby clinging to the back of the baboon. There are other... Um, gazelle, other antelopes. These are topi, which I think they look as if somebody, maybe Jan Oren has got her paints out and um, painted the, 
uh, the legs and the, and the, or maybe it was one of our other artists, but um, they, they look so elegant with this amazing sort of like blue jean design on them. Um, and there are about 15 to 20,000 topi and they migrate east to west. So they were slightly different, a very shorter migration, um, beautiful animals. There are plenty of water buck found um, in the Serengeti. Again, I, I just love their ears. And then there are these much smaller um, animals and antelopes like the um, little tiny dikers, which is about a couple of feet high, with huge eyes. And they tend to not go around in herds and run away from predators. They tend to be um, in, in singles or one or two animals and they are sneaking quietly around the undergrowth and hiding um, for a slightly different tactic. And then you have um, a slightly bigger uh, species that is actually called a clip springer, which is, uh, we found a lot of them in the north. They're always associated with those granite outcrops. And I wanted to show you this photo. You can see if you look closely at the hoof, they're really standing on the tippy tiptoes of their hoofs. And it's that, and they can climb vertically up and down the, 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 the granite. It's absolutely extraordinary that they can get a toehold on the rock and they're so sure footed stunning to watch them. Then I'm sure if you've been there, you've, you've seen a lot of warthog, warthog with her babies. And again, a lot of people think they're really ugly. I, I think they're rather cute myself. Um, you've got banded mongoose and other species of mongoose that are found throughout the area. And then you've got rock hyrax, uh, as well as tree hyraxes, that are also very cute. And then you have the bat-eared fox, which is often found in the plains. And they're, to me, really interesting because those big ears are really fascinating adaptation. They eat dung beetles and they can actually listen and hear for, listen for the dung beetles underneath the soil. So I think that that's just an amazing adaptation. Now, anywhere there's water sources, um, if you have suitable pools, you're going to get hippopotamus. Because I, I looked at this one, I thought, my goodness, that guy needs to go to the dentist. Um, but uh, they, they look very frightening in the water, but they're actually much more frightening on land. So in the dry season, they're all crushed together in the few pools that exist. And the water and the smell is unbelievably awful. I just want to let you know that in case you can go there. And you can see how sort of fetid the water is in this picture. And this beautiful little baby with a, with a mother there. And this is in the wet season, they're much more spread out, there are many more pools, the water's much cleaner. And, but they do leave even during the day and go travel from one pool to another. And if you remember, they're probably the most dangerous bat and buffalo, but particularly rhinoceros, uh, hippopotamus are very, very dangerous to meet on land. Um, so you have to know the area and not make the mistake of running into a hippopotamus. There are other wonderful animals like you know, water monitors. And of course there are crocodiles. And in the dry season, you don't always, you may find them quite far away from where the water is. So you have to remember they do, or again, they will cross from one water source to another. But in the wet season, they're plentiful and they're found throughout the Serengeti. Now the birds, I'm not quite sure how much time I have left, Nelly. How much, how are we doing for time? Uh, we're good, Nigella. Please keep going. It's fascinating. Please. Oh, um, well, now I've got to the birds. I can do it all day. But um, <laughs> so I just enclosed a few photographs of the birds of the Serengeti. Um, it's amazingly rich. I think over 500, I think it's closer to 600 species of birds have been recorded in the Serengeti. Um, these are secretary birds. They're several feet high. They have these ridiculous long legs. But if you look at them closely, they're like eagles with really long legs. And they walk most of the time. They can fly. They nest on the top of large trees, like this large acacia tree. But they mainly stride across the plains looking for snakes, and in this case, a lizard that this secretary bird has, has got to eat. So they're um, really acting like a lot of the, the small mammal predators do. They're feeding on, on similar things like snakes and lizards and, and insects and small mammals as well. 
And then there, in contrast, is the tiny sunbirds, absolutely jewel-like birds that, um, if you look carefully in the in the savanna, you will see a lot of different species. But even the common species are incredibly beautiful. There, this is a, a superb starling that uh, you know I've actually seen them in the parking lot in Arusha, but um, they look much more exotic when you see them in the uh, savanna. Hornbills. These are Van der Decken's hornbills. Uh, you've got the female on the, the left, just black and white, and then you've got the male with the, the red coloration on the bill. Lots of different species of hornbills in the Serengeti. Stunning, beautiful, beautiful birds. Uh, there are ground hornbills as well. I don't have any photographs of those. Um, there are also um, a lot of Franklins or what they call spurfowl in this area. This is a a yellow-throated um, spurfowl. This is a sort of pheasant-sized animal. And this is its cousin, which is the gray-breasted spurfowl. And they often make alarm calls that will alert a guide to a predator being close by. Um, and they, I have fond memories of being woken up by them in the morning. This is probably sort of an iconic bird of, of Africa and the Serengeti. This is the lilac breasted roller, which I think is just absolutely stunning. I, I, the colors of this bird just never cease to amaze me. And in flight, it's even more beautiful. Now, a lot of birds migrate from Europe and spend the winter in the Serengeti. And the white stork is no exception. You know, and those are the storks that, that um, bring babies to people, well, at least in myth. Um, but they're found nesting on the top of churches in Hungary, for example. They come down to the Serengeti. At this time of year, the wet season, there is so much food that there is enough food left over for the migratory birds without competing with the locals. So here you've got a white stork finding a little snake um, for a snack. And then there are just incredible songbirds and just beautiful designs and splashes of color. This is a rosy patched bushrike, um, just singing its heart out right in front of the vehicle, absolutely overwhelmingly lovely. Um, and then you have, look carefully in a patch of ground, you see this beautiful speckled pigeon, for example. And this is a, um, a white-breasted or white-fronted shrike, uh, which are particularly uh, good at catching insects. Again, this, at this time of year, these are shrikes just catching a lot of insects and in the grass and the shrubs. It's just an abundance of food for these animals and predatory birds that come. There are also other look, fascinating big bird. This is the heaviest flighted bird in Africa. This is the Cory Bustard, which is a very large, again, several, uh, about three feet high, um, beautiful bird that you'll see in the plains um, and in the savanna, but, but mostly in the plains. Lots of birds of play, like this beautiful crested eagle that always looks as if, you know, it's a, um, done, it had its hair especially done, but is very recognizable because of that crest. And of course, you know, the, there are the biggest flightless bird around, which of course is the ostrich, which you will see in the savannah and in the plains as well. This is a male because he's, he's got this black coloring instead of brown. Weaver birds of different species everywhere. This is a, uh, a red-headed male weaver bird in the process of making a nest trying to impress a female. And again, in the, in the wet season, uh, you're going to have an awful lot of birds around any wetland or in the dry season, any patch of water. So in this picture, you've got the, all these little nests uh, that are hanging down of a species of weaver You've got egrets, you've got herons, and on, right on the shore, you've got a lapwing. And you've got bee eaters around. This is a little bee eater. It's actually the national bird of um, Tanzania because it incorporates some of the national colors. And then you've got in the water, you've got jacanas, the African jacana, 
it has these big feet that actually spread out, allow it to pretty much um, walk on water or certainly walk over the vegetation that's on top of the water. And then you've got these strange herons, these hemocops, with these strange wedge-shaped head um, that look very, very strange primeval birds. And then around water sources, you all have um, sea um, fish eagles which um, are again, very beautiful, very elegant birds. And in the lakes of the south of the Serengeti, um, you will find flamingos. In these lakes and other water sources, you're also gonna find African spoonbills. And again, everywhere in these areas, you're gonna find different weavers. This is a, um, a spectacle fronted uh, weaver, a little pair of them. And this is one of my favorite birds. This is a bare-faced go-away bird. I mean, what a wonderful name, go-away bird. And it's eating a, a fruit. I think that's a manula fruit that it's eating. Um, just, just lovely birds. And then we have um, one of my very, very favorite birds that I was thrilled to see because they're not easy to see. And that is, it's a pygmy falcon. So it's a bird of prey, but it is, well, maybe a little bit smaller than my hand. So that they're, they're tiny and they eat insects. Um, and I was very, very excited to uh, find um, a pair of them. So with that, I think I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, this shot is in the Northern Serengeti um, at sunset with uh, just everything wet from the rains, lush from the grass. And I hope that um, if you haven't been to this, to this part of the world and want to get a sense of what nature was like thousands of years ago, please go to the Serengeti. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nigella, for this exceptional presentation. You transported us to the Serengeti and showed oh, us good. this beautiful, beautiful animals. Um, we have uh, very nice comments from uh, our guests. And if you have questions, you could either raise your hand or we can place them in the chat room. Uh, you can unmute yourself if you like, if, if I can't see you uh, or wave your hand. Oh, I see there's a question here about caribou migrations. Okay. Um, Yes, the numbers are much smaller, but, but caribou is still one of the, uh, the, the remnants of a great migration that you can still see. So that's a, a really good example. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Vicky, do you have a question? Um, yes. Can I just ask it? It'll be simpler. Go ahead, please. Yes, please. Okay. Um, well, I was thinking about the whole idea of migration. The wildebeest migration makes kind of sense because they follow the rains, even if there's like if there's too many, then they kind of wander back to the where it, you know, north. But uh, what could explain storks where they go so far? Is there some theory about that? Yes, there is. There absolutely is. In fact, there's been quite a lot of research about, well, why do birds migrate like that? You know, it's a great, you have to expend an awful lot of energy to migrate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really very similar principle is that the, the wild beasts are really going for food. Mm -hmm. And so are the storks. There isn't enough food for them when they overwinter in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to an area, they have to go a long way to an area where they're not competing with local birds, mm -hmm. so that there's room for them. There's, a, there's room for them in the ecosystem for them to eat as much as they like in that area. So again, it, it really tends to boil down to food migration. So that's why the storks, the wheat ears, lots of other species, uh, the cuckoo, are all going in search of a place where there's abundant food. But it seems, but the thing is, it seems stupefyingly far, so... <laughs> I mean, the wonder is how they know, you know, how they ever figured it out in the first place or if they're just, I don't know, genetically programmed or, you know, what 
Well, that's a, a whole nother lecture about bird migration, which I'm happy to, to give. <laughs> okay. to it's a, <laughs> wonderful. But um, yes, I mean, there, there seems to be a lot of innate um, behavior of, of how of how they, they learn to follow landmarks, how they um, actually learn to follow um, various different, uh, the magnetic compass, the Earth's magnetic um, right. lines that they seem to be able to follow. So um, yes, I think it basically, we think it's a huge feat for them to do this, but we don't have wings for one thing, and we don't have the abilities that they do um, for finding their way. I mean, I can, you know, I can, can, I get lost everywhere, so I, it always amazes me. I can I ask? Yes, please. Hi. With regards to migrating birds, how do you assign which is really their home habitat? Since they oh. go there in two places, usually um, rule of thumb is that it's that they basically, it's just like anyone with two homes, but it's where they breed. It's like, so where they like breed. their residency, is where, okay. where they pay taxes, is, is tends to be <laughs> assumed where, where they're breeding. But um, but they are, they do live in more than one place. So it's it's not like storks are only European. Storks are international, if you like. Mm. Thanks. And Dorothy was asking a question also. Would you like to unmute yourself, Dorothy? I'm very fascinated by the fact that the wildebeest and the zebra migrate together. Now, obviously that helps predation if you're with, or with a big herd of wildebeest and it, it takes them to food, but are there any other interesting interactions between the two species? Well, yes. Um, in fact, it, it looks as if there are more interactions than there probably are because it always looks as if the wildebeest are following the zebra, you know, that they, they, they're, um, they're leading the pack. They always find them, tend to find them in front when they're moving. And so quite a bit of work has been done on that and, and really decided that what's really happening is that the zebra like to eat the very tips of the grass. And so they want to get there first. So they're always in a hurry to get there first. Um, the wildebeest like to follow them because they are better at knowing where to go, but they're also, they respond to predators very well. Um, so the wildebeest gain a lot from, from that. So, uh, and of course the zebra are safer in numbers being with the wildebeest. So that's, appears to be what's happening there. Thank you. And we have one more question from Jane. Um, you mentioned one of your small birds as a bird of prey. What is the definition? Aren't all insect eating birds, birds of prey? Um, that's a very good question. No, it, it simply means it belongs to a particular group of birds. Um, in fact, it's very closely related to peregrine falcons, these little pig, pygmy falcons. And, you know, I'm having a, a brain blip and I can't remember the Latin name for this particular group, but it's basically a, a, a same genus of birds. So it's not because they all eat insects. Faye, I see you have a great, your hand up. I don't understand evolutionary biology very well. I don't understand why there's so many different adaptations to the same environment. <laughs> Is that a possible thing you can answer? Um, how long do you have? Um, Did you hear me? Yes. Why are there so many adaptations um, to the same environment? <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, it, it depends. I mean, how, where I you, don't, it, it's a little bit safer you know, from where you start answer? from. Um, can you give me an example that w what made you think to ask that question? Was there? There's birds, there's leopards, there's giraffes, all in the Serengeti, all in the same environment, mm -hmm. but they have made different adaptations to uh, feed themselves and reproduce. And I'm not sure why there's not just one species that survives in the Serengeti, like the oh, wildebeest so, seems to so why do very you well. So, much. so you're asking really why there's so much biodiversity in the Serengeti? Yes, okay. Why it's so richness of species? And so one of the thing is that, that a lot of animals have involved to um, feed in a, an area where they're not competing with another species. And so they're going to make particular adaptations that are going to involve, depending on, on 
you know, if you're a bird, you can fly, so you can develop different adaptations than, than something that has hooves and has to run. Um, but it's one of the main reasons why there's so much biodiversity in the Serengeti is actually very much connected to what's happening in the ocean. And interesting enough, because that controls the climate in the Serengeti. So if you suddenly have um, a very wet, a very dry season, and that actually means a certain species of rodent will absolutely flourish and there'll be tons of them and they'll breed really well. Um, that means that there is a lot more food for a particular predator. So the ratio will shift and it will go back and forth depending on what the weather is doing. If you have lots of El Ninos, you're gonna get a, a very different um, population dynamic or population levels than you would have if you have um, a La Nina, for example. So in other words, climate is very important in, as well as uh, food availability in controlling the diversity of an area. But if it wasn't for the wildebeest, you would not have nearly so much diversity because you would have just huge encroachment of thick scrub um, and eventually woodland, and you wouldn't have any of the open plains and all these gazelles and all these other animals that eat the grass would disappear. So it's, it's a very dynamic system with different um, species coming and going. But for example, if you take all the different species of gazelle, they tend to eat different kinds of grasses or different levels of grass. So they're not competing with one another. They've adapted to, okay, well, nobody's eating this species. I'm gonna just eat these, this group of grasses here and I'm going to thrive and do really well because nobody else wants it. So that's a very <laughs> short answer to a really big question that it's um, several PhDs long. I'm sure it's complicated, thank you. Oh, but it's a great question actually. I never understood why an ant doesn't become a giraffe, but then I have a lot to learn. <laughs> well, because it's an insect for stuff. So one thing is limited by its exoskeleton. That's a very, you know, very important reason that if you, you can't get beyond a certain size if you're an insect without the whole thing collapsing, because you're not made of bone, you're made of keratin. So one of the things, that's why I said it depends where you start from it's very difficult to suddenly evolve into something else. But I, let's talk about that over a glass of wine sometime when, when COVID is no longer around. <laughs> Thank you, Nigella. Do we have any other question for Nigella? If you can just wave your hand or uh, let me know in the chat. Okay. Well, Nigella, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. We were very excited to have you. And um, we have next month, Professor Edward Watts from the Department of History. We, will, we hope to see you then. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Nelly. Thank, thank you. you.